Hello? Hello, hello. Neil. I hope so. <laughs> How you doing, man? Not too bad. How are you? I'm doing all right. It's great to finally get the chance to talk to you. Yeah, I'm sorry about uh, last week. Um, I don't know what happened. My tech explained it to me, and uh, about three words in, he was beyond me. And anyway, <laughs> uh, that's the way us techies are. We, uh, we, you know, it starts sounding like blah 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 every uh, every time we start talking. Well, I just I don't have any, you know, chops when it comes to computers, and you know, I'm just. At the mercy of these things, something goes wrong, I'm screwed. <laughs> no answers. You said that it took you, what, six hours to get your computer replaced? That, that, that seems like a long time. Well, you know, there's just stuff that I guess has to be downloaded and configured. And uh, I don't know. He's very thorough, this guy. Oh, well, that's a good reason to have him then. Yeah. So okay. now I have Skype on both computers, and um, apparently it works. Yeah, it uh, it's working great on my end. Okay. Yeah, I've I got him to um, put in my uh, real microphone. I'm not using one of those um, little, uh, you know, thirty two dollar camera microphones. This is a Shure SM five B microphone. So. So, sounds like you know a lot more about the uh, the microphones than I probably ever will. Yeah. Well, uh, when you do radio and voiceover, you kind of become obsessed with what mic you sound best on. And so does that mean you got like a, a big collection of microphones then? Not really. No, I have this uh, Shure SM5B, which is really. I just it's kind of a nostalgia mic. It was a a mic that was used a lot in radio at one time. And then I have one other. It's a Sennheiser 416, and that's sort of the industry standard, at least on the West Coast. That's what most of the studios use. So I use it too. Okay. All right, so you're just kind of following the standard then. Yeah, they, they're sort of used to a certain sound, the buyers, and... Um, you know, if the day comes that it suddenly there's a hot new mic that everybody's using, then I'll have to switch. But amazingly enough, the 416 has been the microphone since, I think, the 70s. Wow. And periodically, studios, well, we're going to try something different, and they always end up going back to the Sennheiser. <laughs> that, that is, uh, that's great that you have such a uh, longevity for the technology. You'd figure that would have changed over the years. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't know why, but the Sennheiser continues to be the one. Uh, huh. Which is fine with me. I don't have to go out and spend a couple of grand on some sexy new mic everybody's fallen in love with. You know. <laughs> I get it. You don't have to. Uh, Follow the Joneses. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, how much time do you have for me? Oh, as much as you can stand. I, I you know, I may fall asleep at some point, but <laughs> we don't want that. If you hear snoring, you know the interview is over. <laughs> okay. I'll keep that in mind. Hopefully, we don't get there. Uh, okay. So, let me. <clears throat> Well, I, I know I've got my recording started. I already verified that. Uh, so. Let me just ask you, not that I'm, you know, a potty mouth or anything, but things do slip out. What's your policy on uh, uh, profanity? Yeah, the uh, um, the media group that I'm with is family friendly. Okay. So, yeah, if you could curb that, that's fine. But if not, I I edit them before we post. So if there's something that I get to bleep out, I'm actually completely fine with doing that because I think it's funny. Okay. Well, I'll try not to make too much work for you, but something <laughs> may, something may slip out. Oh, it's completely fine. Just uh, be comfortable. Okay. For the Romans, give me sight beyond sight. 
Greetings, Starfighter. You have been recruited by the Star League to defend the frontier against Zur and the Kodan Armada. Get ready? Prepare for blast off. Hey, Doc, we better back up. We don't have enough roads to get up to 88. Roads? Well, we're going, we don't need roads. Remember, no matter where you go, there you are. This is 80's Reboot Overdrive Podcast. Oh my god. That is like so dated. Alright, this is 80s Reboot Overdrive and I am Dave. Online I have the most awesome voiceover actor uh, with just way, way, way too many 80s credits to list right now, uh, Neil Ross. We, oh, I thought, you, I thought you had booked Jim Cummings, it sounded like, from the, <laughs> from the intro. Or oh. maybe Frank Welker, I don't know. I'm I'm honored to to be described thusly. <laughs> yeah, I was going through uh, Neil, and I, I wanted to let you know the reason why I reached out to you to talk to you is because I am a fan of the cartoon Visionaries. Um, so much so that the avatar that I have on Twitter is Leoric. Oh, how nice! Well, you're few and far between, but uh, I appreciate you, fans of Visionaries. I mean. It it only ran one season, and uh, I, you know, we all enjoyed working on it, and I thought it was a good show, but for some reason, uh, one season, and bye-bye. So they didn't give you any reason why it didn't last that long? Well, the actors are sort of cut off from the uh, production company. Uh, There's sort of several uh, pay grades up the ladder. And so you sort of hear things, but you never really get get the answer. I suspect uh, the toys did not did not do well. That's usually the reason that these shows didn't last. You you could have an excellent show with uh, really good ratings, and if the toys didn't uh, fly off the shelves, you were gone, which was unfortunate. But. Yeah, which you know, in a lot of uh, the the way it was created back then, obviously the cartoons followed the toy line. So, mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, I guess you were looking for, you know, the toy line to be taken off and flying, flying off the shelves as you mentioned it. And it's just weird that you would think that a theme that has knights and holograms, you would think that that would have been really big. Yeah, so. it, it, you know, uh, one of my favorite books is uh, called Adventures in the Screen Trade. And I'm spacing the chap's name. It may come to me. Uh, He wrote uh, the screenplay for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And I believe he also wrote the screenplay for All the President's Men. And I think in the first page of the book, he says, here's the truth about Hollywood. Nobody knows anything. They all claim they do, but they don't. And, you know, why Transformers and not uh, Visionaries? And I can s- sort of throw out some half-baked theories, but I don't think anybody really knows. It's just some things click that the zeitgeist is right for the for the show at a particular time, and bang, you're into the stratosphere. But there's no way of no way of predicting it, at least none that I've ever found. Yeah, because I mean, you had that kind of popularity with GI Joe and uh, Voltron. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Transformers, obviously, also. So I, I, I guess when you're going into those projects, you really don't know, do you? No. I, you know, people I, – I still do conventions, thanks primarily to Transformers and secondarily to G.I. Joe. And, and people will frequently ask, when you guys were working on these shows, did you ever, in your wildest dreams – Uh, think that these shows would be remembered and revered uh, 25, 30 years later? And the answer in my case is no. And I think most of the other actors would tell you the same thing. 
At the time we were doing those shows in the mid 80s, the conventional wisdom was that most shows had a two or three year uh, life and then the, uh, the audience would outgrow them and there would be a new crop of uh, young kids and they would want something different. And so most shows, one, two, three seasons, goodbye. Once in a while, there was a gigantic uh, success like uh, the Smurfs, which I think ran for seven years. But that was highly unusual. And so, yeah, I mean, when I think of the, you know, the superstar that Peter Cullen has become, and I'm sure he would tell you when he was you know, doing those initial uh, Transformers episodes, never in his wildest dreams could he have imagined what happened. And why that particular show? Uh, my stupid little theory is people love to anthropomorphize. <clears throat> you know, when you're a little kid, you love talking rabbits and bears and things like that. And then you get a little older, and it's fun to sort of anthropomorphize robots. Imagine them with, you know, emotions and personalities. And I think that might have been part of the key to why Transformers was so successful. That and the fact that it, the gimmick of these uh, robots being able to transform into different things. But I think it's just the anthropomorphizing of, of the characters that maybe made it more interesting. I don't know. I don't that, know. That, I, I think that. You know, there was also the draw of the cars. You know, you had uh, a lot of 80s things take off that, you know, centralized around cars. Uh, and I think Transformers really lent to that love affair with, you know, cars and, uh, you know, obviously robots, you know, which were really yeah. big in the 80s. So you combine those two worlds. And then, as you mentioned, you know, bringing personality to the robots. Yeah, I could see how that would really take off. But, you know, I don't know going into it, if you're handed uh, a script or you're being told, you know, here's what we're going to do and we want you to be a part of it. You know, are you really going into it and going, oh, this is going to go big or are you just going into it because uh, it's a gig? Well, I, just speaking personally, I always go in with the uh... – with a, with, with a whole lot of uh, enthusiasm and optimism, and I always try to give 100% when I'm in there. Uh, but as I say, there's just no predicting. I've, I've worked just as hard on shows that I'm sure you never even heard of. And why they, why they didn't fly, I, I just don't know. Well, I've got to ask you about one. I'm just curious because I'm looking through your credits. Um, do you remember working on Rubik the Amazing Cube? You know, I don't. No, okay. isn't that funny? It's it. <laughs> well, your your list is additional voices, so I, it didn't sound like you yeah. were like one of the main ones. Yeah. What what used to happen in those days was, uh, and and it's still true, for for the for the day player payment, they can ask you to do three characters, and some of us in the little community of actors in the 80s developed a reputation for being able to do multiple voices. Some people can't. For some reason, they can't. Or or they have a voice that is so distinctive, even though they try to disguise it, it's obviously still them. But there were a number of us that ha the directors knew, oh, if I bring Neil in, he can give me a cop, a judge, and a parking attendant. And so if they had these incidental roles they needed to fill, uh, sometimes you'd find yourself working on a show that you never worked for again. You might do one episode and you would be a parking attendant, a judge and a cop or whatever, and maybe only two or three lines for each character. But, you know, a gig's a gig. <laughs> but those, those were easy to forget because you're in and you're out and you really didn't have much involvement with the show at all. You just worked one session. So do you remember working on... Um... The cartoon, The Dukes. Oh yes, that I do remember. Yeah. What was that one like? Was it uh, fun to be on the set on that one? Well, we weren't really on the set. Uh, they had to do it at night because the guys were working on the on-camera version in the daytime. Okay. And I happened to work. I didn't work with the real Dukes. I don't know if you even remember this. The The two leading actors wanted a better deal, and they held out, and the studio tried to replace them with two other guys. 
yeah, uh, Duke Schneider, Tom Wopat, and then they had the, uh, I remember the character names were Coy and Vance. Yeah, well, I worked, I worked with them. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. And uh, some of the other folks on the show, I'm, 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 gosh, I'm spacing his name. Who was the, uh, you know, kind of down home guy that talked like this and. Who, the, the, uh, Uncle Jesse? Yeah, I think so. What, do you remember the, the actor's name? Oh, I am going to get in trouble for not knowing that. Yeah. Well, it may come to us. Nice man. I just remember uh, him coming over and introducing himself to me. And I mean, this was a man I had watched on television since I was 10 years old. And he introduced, told me his name, and I told him my name. And he, he was just very warm and welcoming. I remember that. Denver Pyle. Denver Pyle, thank you. Yeah, I remember that. I think I did those because um, I could do a lot of different accents. And I think the gimmick was they were going around the world. So one episode they would be Greek, and the next episode, uh, I don't know what, Swiss, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I jumped, I jumped you right in there, but I'm curious. How did you get started in doing voice acting? Well, it's... Uh, a long story that I sort of condense into a quick one, and then if you want to ask follow-ups, that's fine. I started out as a disc jockey, I did, and a production guy, and I did that for about 20 years. And then I found out along the way about this wonderful business called voiceovers. I didn't even know it existed. And the minute I found out about it, I said, this is what I really should be doing. And um, when I finally, well, at, in those days, uh, voiceover was only happening really in two cities, New York and Los Angeles. And uh, so I put on the full court press to get a radio job in Los Angeles and did, and then immediately started going to workshops and looking for an agent and going to auditions. And it took me about five years to break in. That's the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so really, disc jockey was kind of your first main gig had absolutely no idea what to do with my life. I seemed to be able to make people laugh. I seemed to be able to entertain them. But uh, oddly enough, I was somewhat of an introvert. Somehow the idea of being a disc jockey appealed to me. You could perform, but you could do it in private. You know, nobody would, was, there was no audience. Uh, nobody was looking at you while you did it. And uh, I just, uh, one night I used to listen to a guy in Los Angeles named Bill Balance. And I thought he was the hippest thing on two feet. And he was quite a, an amazing talent. And he was on KFWB, which was the big rock station in those days. He was on from nine to midnight. And I was listening to him one evening. It was about 1140. I got the transistor under the pillow. And uh, he says, well, uh, something along the lines of as soon as I get off the air at midnight, going to jump into my brand new sports car, go pick up my new uh, girlfriend. She's under contract of Warner Brothers. <laughs> and uh, we're going to get in my sports car and we're going to cruise the strip. And I lay there in bed and I said, he's having the life I want to have. I didn't even know what cruising the strip was. <laughs> 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 or how to do it. All I knew was I, I it suddenly this thought came to me, my God, maybe this is something I could do with my collection of weird talents, alleged talents. I could be a disc jockey. And uh, when I announced to my parents the next morning that I had discovered my life's calling and they were appalled, that made it perfect. You know, anytime you can tick off your parents. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And then I, uh, you know, it started out as sort of a goofy idea, but the more I thought about it and the more research I did, uh, the more I became obsessed with the idea. And then I discovered that I was living in San Diego at the time that there was a radio station, KCBQ, that had this glassed in studio, uh, in this building downtown and you could stand in the street and look up and you could see the DJ at work. And I haunted that corner for hours, just watching these guys and, and saying, I've got to get up in that window somehow. I've got to, I've got to get up in that room and do that. I was not the only one, by the way, there's a lot of, a lot of other guys my age who 
former San Diegans who did exactly the same thing. So you were uh, disc jockey groupies. Kind of, yeah. I never really, <laughs> well, I, I met one radio guy in that period, but he was not really a disc jockey. We we just, we wanted to, we wanted to do what those guys were doing. And yeah, I guess in a way we were groupies. There were certain uh, guys I, I admired a great deal, you know, uh, various air talents that I used to hear that I, I probably stole from and <laughs> emulated and... Uh, I mean, that's how you do it. You start out imitating somebody, and then hopefully you find your own style. When did you discover that you had the talent to be able to just do the different voices, or is this just something that you've just honed that skill over time? No. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's something that I started doing very young. Uh, I don't know why. I, you know, some lucky kids can sit down at the piano and play it. I used to listen to the radio a lot and I was not particularly taken with the music of the time because rock and roll hadn't started yet. And so I would tune around and listen to people talking and uh, I became fascinated by the different sounds of, that the human voice produces and the different accents. Why because somebody's from a certain part of the world, do they sound the way they sound? How did this happen? And I began trying to reproduce what I heard. And one day, I probably was eight years old. Uh, my dad brought a tape recorder home from work. And in those days, there was no such thing as home tape recorders. I mean, this thing was the size of a suitcase and probably cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And I, I asked if I could record something, and he said, okay. And I pulled out the Sunday Funny papers, and I did the entire Sunday Funnies, played all the parts, did all the sound effects, and played it back and listened to it, and I was quite pleased. Not really an ego trip, it's just it sounded like what I had been trying to accomplish. And I, I, you know, I, I really didn't know what I was doing really sounded like and hearing it back on tape was okay then yeah okay and uh, then there were a couple of huge influences I I began listening to uh, I was living in Canada at the time and listening to the CBC and they broadcast a lot of stuff from the BBC the British Broadcasting Corporation and there was a show called the Goon Show I don't know if you've ever heard of it I have not no it was a radio show. It was on in the 50s. Uh, goon, in, in America, it means somebody who breaks your leg for not paying or your gambling debts. But in England, it means more like idiot. So if we did it in America, it would be called the idiot show. Uh, it, just three guys. Um, the, most of the scripts were written by a guy named Spike Milligan, who I just thought was a comic genius. The show influenced a ton of young British uh, kids and all the Monty Python guys uh, say the goon show was the, the beginning for them that 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 no goon show no uh, Monty Python basically and one of the three guys was a, a man named Peter Sellers and I don't know if you even remember him I do I remember yeah. Peter Sellers sure well at the time he was utterly unknown uh, he was just a, a name but he the other two guys well, one of the guys just did one character, and then Spike Milligan did three or four characters. Peter Sellers played everybody else. He must have done 15 different characters. And I was uh, uh, just fascinated by this guy and the, and the voices he could produce. And, and what I liked about it was, even though they were ridiculous, over-the-top, cartoony voices, they were real somehow. You could picture them in your mind's eye. They existed and I thought, what a wonderful thing to be able to do that. And uh, he was a huge influence on me. And then somehow I got hold of, hold of a record by a, an actor named, well, he was more than an actor. He was a director, a writer, a, an actor. A, he did a, did a million things. His name was Peter Ustinoff. And he did this record called uh, the Grand Prix du Rock, I think. It was a satire of uh, radio coverage of automobile racing. And they have this ridiculous uh, uh, sports car race around the Rock of Gibraltar. <laughs> Which, <you know. laughs> and uh, 
the cars actually go into the ocean and come back out. I mean, it's just surrealistic. But he played everybody on this record. He did all the sound effects. He did all the voices. And, of course, it's all these different accents, including American. He could do a spot, even though he was British, he could do a spot-on American accent, which a lot of them couldn't in those days. They tried to sound American, and it came out like this. Uh <laughs> But he didn't fall into that trap. And again, even though I knew every voice I was hearing was being done by this one man, these characters he created were so real and so believable. I, I, I listened to that record over and over and over and over again. It was, it was a compulsion. And I didn't even know why I was doing it. I was just fascinated by this thing. But then a year or so later, I'd be telling a dirty joke to my horrible little friends in the lunch court. And I, it, I'd think, oh, a German accent would punch this up, and I could do one. Of course, what I was doing was Peter Ustinov doing a German accent, but <laughs> what did my idiot friends know, you know? Right, right. So and, they hadn't heard the record, so. So I used to just sit in my room making noises and doing voices the way other kids sit in the room and, and you know, put a balsa plane together or something uh, or, or collect stamps. Just, you know, making stupid noises and doing voices and accents was sort of my hobby. And it never occurred to me that I could make any, any money with it or make a living out of it. Uh, it was just something I, I seemed to have a compulsion to do. All right. Um, did you ever get a chance to work with Brian Cummings? Oh, yes, many times. In fact, uh, a quick story. I was trying to get an agent, and I managed to get an appointment with to actually meet an agent, which is which was a hell of a break because uh, most of the agents uh, send us a demo, and if we like it, we'll call, and if we don't like it, we won't call. And the problem is, if they don't call, you don't get any feedback on why they they're not interested in you. What do you need me to do more? What 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 what, what would make me desirable to you as a as a talent? So here I was sitting in this man's office and he's listening to my demos and he didn't like what he heard and uh, basically told me to forget about it. And I was almost out the door and he said, oh, I've got an idea for you. Um, he said, one of my clients, he's kind of like you. He used to be in radio and uh, now he's doing voiceovers and uh, he's, he's giving a workshop and uh, you might uh, be able to learn something if you went to this workshop. So why don't you try that? And I went to this workshop, and that was really the beginning for me. And guess who was running the workshop? It was Brian Cummings. Oh, okay. So he uh, he was kind of my mentor, one of my first mentors in, in Los Angeles. And, of course, we've worked together ever since uh, many, many times. Wonder lovely man. Yeah, and the reason why I bring him up is because I I had interviewed him before for the podcast. And it was just hilarious that he actually – I actually – able to have him do a conversation between Dr. Mindbender and Bumble Lion from Wuzzles. It, it was just hilarious. And, it, you know, so a, a lot of the conversation was, you know, if you were to, you know, have the characters that you've done have a conversation together, what that might sound like. Have you ever been in the situation where you're working on a series where you've got to voice two parts at the same time talking to each other? Yeah, that comes up from time to time. I'm not the best at that. Most directors will say, what do you want to do here? Do you want to just power through it or do you want to do one character at a time and have me feed you the other lines? And I usually say, let me do one at a time. Sometimes I can get through it, but, you know, I'm, I'm not as good as uh, the Brian Cummings is and the, uh, the Frank Welkers. There's a funny story about Welker. Um, well, uh, maybe it's too involved. <laughs> Save that for another time. But I mean, those guys are really good at jumping back and forth uh, between the uh, voices, uh, and I, I'm, I'm okay, but I'm not great at it. Oh, I, you, you, you teased me on that Walker one. Now I'm really curious. Well, let me try to make it not too involved. There's a little bit of inside baseball to understand this. They don't, uh, in most cartoons, they don't want you to overlap. In other words, they don't want to characters talking at the same time even just a syllable in other words if the lines are i'm going to kill you oh no you're not 
they've got to have a split second of silence between I'm going to kill you and oh, no, you're not. If the oh, no, you're not comes in too soon, you got to do it again because you haven't you've had what they call an overlap. And they need the lines to be separate because they may need to slide them around depending on whatever is happening with the picture. So we're doing, I think it was Transformers, and a scene comes up where two of Frank's characters are talking to each other, and he launches into it. And I have to tell you that Wally Byrne never looked at us through the glass. He, al he always just looked at the storyboard, which is a little cartoon of what the, car of what the cartoon is going to look like. So Frank is blasting through this scene, these two c characters yelling at each other. And I mean, it's just astonishing how he's able to do it. And all of a sudden, uh, Wally hits the button and he goes, oh, we got to go back. We had an overlap. And we're all screaming at him. Wally, he's doing everything. He, how, it's impossible to overlap yourself. <laughs> and uh, Wally, oh, I'm so oh, Frank. Oh, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I thought I heard an overlap. I mean, that's how fast Frank was going. Uh, Wally honestly thought there was an overlap, which, of course, isn't humanly possible because there's only one Frank Welker, as far as I know. <laughs> oh, that's good. But he, what he, he was just not even realizing that he was just going straight through. Yeah, well, he had his, uh, Wally had his head down looking at the storyboard, and in his right. mind he was hearing two actors. <laughs> that, and, and he thought he heard an overlap. Oh, uh, that's a credit to Welker, then. Oh, yeah. I mean, that yeah. gives you an idea of how fast Frank was jumping in and out of these two characters. Right. It's just blindingly fast to the point where, you know, Wally thought he heard something that didn't really happen. I actually have a Twitter question for you. Uh, Frankie Smith at Frank's a Million, he wants to know, what was your favorite cartoon show to voice? Wow. I enjoyed... Uh, Virtually everything I did, every sh show had its had its strong points. The, the one that I, I think you know uh, brings back the most good memories to me uh, would be Voltron, because you know there was a point where I sat in my living room in San Diego on a Saturday morning watching the cartoons and mostly listening to the cartoons and wondering if I could ever do this work. And ping-ponging back and forth between, well, of course I can. I could do that. And two seconds later, no, you can't. They'd throw you out in a second. Then gradually working my way into the business, and you start meeting, uh, you know, trained actors who are doing this, uh, men and women who've been actors uh, virtually their whole uh, adult lives. And here I'm this uh, disc jockey who somehow sneaked in, you know, and you wonder... Am I good enough? Can I do this? Can I survive in this business? And suddenly, I had the lead role in this huge series. And it was kind of like graduation day. Wow. I guess maybe I can do this. It was, it, was, it was the first really big series and the first really big role I had. And so I'm very fond of uh, Keith and Voltron. Yeah, because because yeah, the uh, the other ones you weren't. Well, I, I mean, like GI Joe though, there wasn't like a lead character anyway, but you were a shipwreck, right? Yeah, well, it was it was a nice part. I think probably the lead uh, character in that show was Duke, played by Michael Bell. Right. I think he was probably the lead, but yeah, it was it was spread around, and 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 sh and uh, shipwreck was a that was a wonderful part. He's he's probably probably the favorite character of all the characters I've I've gotten to do. Is it just something about doing the voice? Is that what makes it fun? No. What What's great about Shipwreck is uh, he's conflicted. And those are the most fun people to play, I think. You know, if you think about it, everybody in G.I. Joe is either really, really good or really, really bad. <laughs> and Shipwreck, uh, you know, he kind of wanted to be with the good guys, but he wasn't real good about taking orders, if you know what I mean. He kind of wanted to do things his way, and uh, he'd get into trouble, And uh, but he meant well. And uh, that was just a—he was the only character in the show that was, that was like that. 
And so uh, it was a wonderful character to play. And it, I actually was in the Navy for a couple of years. And I, I sort of knew guys like that, you know, career Navy guys. And they kind of skirted on the line of uh, maybe going to get into a little bit of trouble here. Uh, but uh, no, they somehow managed to managed to get through it without getting busted. And so, yeah, he was he was a treat to play. Well, I, th- first off, thank you for your service. I really appreciate that. And I'm all, I was also in the Navy uh, for almost nine years. So oh, well, I know, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. And I know exactly the type of person you're talking about. I, I, I had many interactions with uh, type, you know, those types that had the, uh, I'm here for a good reason, but there's an edge there. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And they sort of learn how to work the system. Right. You know, the military, when you first get in, it's bewildering. How does this work? (laughs) And and these guys figure out how it works, and then then they get it to work for them most of the time. Well, you know, I mean, we were all so young at that time, and it's the first time being on our own, and all of a sudden we have a a world to explore. You know, I mean, that's just being young. Yeah. Of course, I sort of did it backwards. I left home at 17, and bounced around, did all this radio nonsense, and the, the draft sort of caught up with me when I was 21, and I had to, that's why I ended up in the Navy. I didn't get drafted. I, I, I fooled him. I joined the Navy. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you. I'll join first. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of had already been out on my own and done all of that, and uh, fr- frankly, <laughs> the Navy was sort of a, sort of screwing up my career, but I managed to, to, to make it work. What was your uh, job specialty in the Navy, if you don't mind I, me asking? No, no. I was a, I was a jur- Navy journalist. Okay. And I was at uh, Sink Pack Fleet in Pearl Harbor. That Sink Pack Fleet stands for Commander-in-Chief, United States Pacific Fleet. Managed not to have to go to sea. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you, so you did uh, the four years then? No, I actually... I, I was in the Naval Reserve. It was this program the Naval Reserve had where you would uh, go to meetings for a year and a uh, two or three week accelerated boot camp. And then you went active for two years and then you were done. Okay. So that was my, uh, and I managed to get to Vietnam, but just for a couple of months. Oh, wow. Okay. And I did nothing heroic there except drink the local beer, which took some courage. <laughs> uh, well, any, anywhere overseas, or sometimes there's some uh, very s- some bravery that's involved in the local cuisine. Yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> and and that was the, 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 that two month period. That was the only time I went to see they gave us an assignment and for a couple of weeks I was bouncing around from aircraft carriers to destroy our escorts and uh, that was the only taste of <laughs> sea life I got. It's definitely a unique lifestyle and my hats off to those people that make that a career. I uh, I just couldn't do it. Well, it's got to be difficult. You know, you're gone for these long periods of time. Of course, other branches of the service it's the same thing and it's right gotta, it's right it's got to be terribly difficult to maintain a, a marriage and a family uh, yeah i'm with you my hat's off to them too uh, it's not easy no no uh so going back to the cartoons uh you remember anything about rock and wrestling me and gene okerlin yeah they called me in to to read for the show and they had all these different wrestlers they wanted me to uh, do and of course all of these vo- all of these wrestlers they all talk like this you know and which I can sort of fake but you know the, the guys who really do have voices like this sort of have an advantage and so I'm sifting through the pile of characters and there's Mean Gene and I I said wait well, hey, let me read for this guy I mean he's a you know ex radio guy and uh you know I can do this and they, oh don't don't worry about that now here here read this other wrestler you know and I'm I'm begging them to let me read for mean gene and they said he's ah, we probably he's probably not even going to be in the show I said well just let me please do one odd oh all right all right one taken out and uh, amazingly enough he ended up in the show and I got to do him 
So that was a that was nice. And uh, I just I just remember that cast. It was uh, <laughs> the most tes- the, the testosterone level in the room had to be off the charts. We had all these guys who sounded like this, you know. And um, yeah, Hulk Hogan was played by uh, Brad Garrett, who has obviously gone on to uh, superstardom. Yes. But, uh, and I'm trying to think who else, just you had all of these guys with voices like this all in a room together. (laughs) And I think we had one poor woman in the cast. (laughs) She had to listen to all of this. Some of these guys were pretty foul mouthed up. Not Brad. Brad's a gentleman. (laughs) Some of the other guys, I heard, I heard things I didn't hear in the Navy. Let me put it that way. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, IMDb. There's uh, Charles Adler, Louis Arquette, James Avery. Oh, yeah, Jim, Jim was in that. Yes, of course he was. He he, he didn't say anything uh, naughty either. He was a very nice man. I enjoyed him. He was fun to work with. Yeah, I was just uh, looking through all the different credits. Are, are you thinking of Jody Carlisle? Yes, Jody. Yeah, poor Jody. She was trapped in there with all of us <laughs> animals. <laughs> she played the fabulous moolah. Yeah. I think she played two parts. Well, they're only giving her credit for one on IMDb. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you can't trust everything. No. Well, maybe maybe my memory is faulty. Uh, it's been a lot of years, hasn't it? Yeah, it's a while ago. And... <laughs> uh, uh, you start uh, poking around on IMDb, and it's, I did that? Really? <laughs> <laughs> if you remember much about working on Jim, uh, playing Howard Sands. No, the, not, a, not a lot of memories. Of, I only did a couple of gems. Okay. Uh, I think also in Jim, I was uh, Hector Ramirez. Yes. And Hector Ramirez... Uh, interestingly enough, I think I'm right in saying he wound up in G.I. Joe, Transformers, Gem, and he's the only one who's, who's, who's in all four of these shows. I think he was in, in Humanoids. And in the Transformers uh, appearance, somebody else voiced him. And why that was, I don't know. But Huh, that's not fair. Well, I think probably... They figured out how the hell with it. <laughs> why <laughs> why pay him to come in? We'll just have somebody else do it. All right. So um, what about Galaxy High School? Rotten Roland. Oh, yeah. That was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, that was uh, directed by Howard Morris, who uh, <clears throat> was in um, the old Sid Caesar show. I don't know if you've ever... Heard of or seen Sid Caesar? Oh yes, I have. Yes. Yeah, what a, it it really was sort of the Saturday Night Live of its era, and there were basically uh, four principal performers. There was Sid Caesar himself and Carl Reiner, and either uh, Imogene Coca or Nanette Fabre, depending on which version of the show you were watching, and then uh, Howard Morris. And there, if you put. Uh, Sid Caesar, Howard Morris into Google, you'll, you'll find, or not Google, I mean YouTube, you'll find some just astonishingly funny stuff. And he was a lovely man, and uh, Howard Morris, and, uh, and just a sweetheart of a director. He, he loved and respected actors, and he let you know it. Even though that only lasted a season, I have, I have fond memories of, of that show. And interestingly enough, uh, there was a young lady in that show that I'd never met or worked with before, and she had this uh, page boy haircut, and she did this voice, and every time she did it, everybody laughed, even when the lines she was reading weren't that funny. And I kept thinking, they should give her more to do, you know? They should punch up this character. This voice is very, very funny. And uh, her name was Nancy Cartwright. And the voice she was doing was a distant cousin of Bart Simpson. Oh, wow. Which, which of course, was all in the future. Right, right. The minute I I heard her doing Bart, I said, oh, that's that's he's he's the cousin of the guy you were doing in uh, in Galaxy High. 
And that's why it was so funny. Sure, sure. And you talk about shows lasting a long time. I mean, what is it now with that show? 30 years or something? Oh, that one's been forever, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was just looking at the uh, uh, the cast of Galaxy High and um, Jennifer Darling. I think I saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. actually just talked to, talked about her recently. Um, we also do a podcast on the Incredible Hulk TV show, mm -hmm. and she was in an episode of that um, that was uh, around a theme of trucker, you know, like a, a, a vein of like smoking the bandit kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, she's a wonderful actress. Oh, absolutely. And, and she was in, um, she was in visionaries as well. Oh yeah, that's right. She was, wasn't she? Yeah. Uh, Vera Lena. Is that right? That's yeah. You're absolutely right. Well, how about that? I know my, uh, visionaries. Evidently you do. I'm cheating. I'm looking at IMDB. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so then that was, you had a good time with Galaxy High, so is there any uh, um, anything you remember about working with any of those actors that um, is like a fun story to tell? Galaxy High, I'm not I'm not remembering any specific stuff from that show. I just remember enjoying working on it. Okay. Because Howard would, made it so much fun. But uh, I'm not. I don't have any specific other than the Nancy story. I don't have anything on that one. Okay. I was a big fan of Centurions, also. Um, so uh, you were Ace McCloud on that one. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and that with Pat Fraley and uh, Vince Edwards. <laughs> and Vince Edwards was the star of Ben Casey, M.D. And uh, that was a television show in the early 60s about an idealistic young doctor. And the opening of the show, you would see a hand with a piece of chalk drawing symbols on the blackboard. And then the voice would be uh, kindly Dr. Zorba, uh, voiced by Sam Jaffe. And he says, birth, life, death. Infinity. Ba -bum, ben Casey, MD. <laughs> so Vince comes in to work on Centurions. And Pat Fraley comes up to him and says, Hey, Vince, how about this? Birth, life, death, infinity. Cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if Vince was going to pop him, but he, he burst out laughing. He had a good sense of humor. And, yeah. and Vince did something so nice for me once. I got hired to do a voiceover on a show called Nurses uh, with Lonnie Anderson and uh, I forget who else. And So the, they had an episode where they were bringing back, uh, bringing TV doctors to the hospital so they had uh, three television doctors, the guy from MASH, uh, the guy from, oh gosh, I'm spat. But they had three actors who had, who had played doctors on television. And Vince was one of the three. So I see Vince uh, coming into the, onto the uh, set. And I sneaked up behind him. And you remember what we used to yell in uh, Centurions when we would go into battle? Uh, power Extreme. Yes, you've done your homework. <laughs> I said I was I, 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 that was when I watched I, I remember that one so Vince is standing there and I start tugging on his sleeve and I do this stupid voice and go, Mr. Edwards Mr. Edwards and he's trying to ignore me <laughs> and I go, Mr. Edwards and he turns around what is it and I said I have two words for you pal power extreme and he bursts out. He goes, Neil, God, it's good to see you, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, you know, we shake hands, talk a little bit. Then I go backstage to the little cubicle with the microphone to do my thing. And I can sort of hear what's going on out front. The, the audience has come in and, and the warm-up guy is, you know, ah, where are you from? You know, this kind of thing. Uh, but I can't really hear it that well. And then I, I hear the voice change. It's not the warm-up guy anymore. It's somebody else. And he's going, 
G.I. Joe! Yay! And I, what the hell is that all about? Well, I found out later Vince had uh, gone over to the warm-up guy and said, can I borrow the microphone? And he said yes. And he said, you know, folks, you're in for a great treat in addition to all the rest of the folks that are going to be in the show today. Backstage doing the voiceover, we have Neil Ross, who is the voice of G.I. Joe. And, uh, you know, the crowd, crowd goes nuts. What a nice thing for him to do. I obviously am not the voice of G.I. Joe, but <laughs> I'm one of the voices of G.I. Joe, but. Well, as I say, what a nice thing for him to do. I, I was uh, absolutely amazed and touched. Yeah, that is, uh, th that sounds like a lot of fun. It sounds like you had a great relationship with him. Yeah, he was a very nice man. I enjoyed working with him. So I want to ask you about the movie credits that you have. Um, you know, specifically, let's say like Back to the Future Part 2, where you're the museum narrator. Mm -hmm. Do you, when you do that type of work, do you just do that in a booth and record it and then they use it or do you actually get to visit the set and interact with the other actors uh no uh, uh the uh, the first description uh, is what what happens uh, it's it's interesting uh, and this is not my observation uh, i don't know if you've heard of jack angel no uh he's another uh a very prolific voice actor he was in uh I'm pretty sure he was in G.I. Joe. I'm not sure if he was in, or no, I think he was in Transformers and not G.I. Joe. I don't recall, but he, he's done a ton of stuff. He made the observation that other than cartoons, we are about the last thing that happens on a project. Uh, a movie gets locked down and then they go into uh, what they call post-production and that's where music and sound effects and sound mixing happens. And somewhere in the middle of that process, sometimes astonishingly close to the release date of the movie, uh, in comes the voiceover person uh, to do his or her thing. The only part of voiceovers where we're the first thing, or almost the first thing that happens, is cartoons. The first thing that happens is somebody has to write a script. But right after that, the actors go into the studio and record the tracks, and only then do the, the animators start to work, and they animate to the already recorded voices. So most of the uh, movie work I've done, the picture's locked down, uh, it's post-production, you go into a, a usually a, a sound stage. It looks like a, sort of a suburban... Um, multiplex theater except there are no seats and it, there's a mic stand and a couple of mics and a screen at the end and on the other end of the of the room is a, a, a glass behind the glass are the technicians and they actually project the film for you and tell you where to come in uh, and they do that with beeps in the headphones and, and basically it goes beep 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 and you start talking on the imaginary fourth beep, and you're right where you're supposed to be. The only time I was ever on the set and did any of that stuff was when I worked on Dick Tracy, but that was an on-camera job. I'm visible in the movie for about a second and a half, but it was an, an on-camera job. Okay. All right, so then uh, I think Gremlins was the other one that was uh, very substantial in the 80s. Uh, was it Gremlins 2? Yeah, I wasn't in the original Gremlins. I did, right. I did, I did work on Gremlins Two, where I played, and I'm thinking I may be the only actor in Hollywood who's ever done this. I played a men's room. <laughs> it was a talking men's room. I'd completely forgotten about it, but I went to a convention, and this guy came up, and he he said, "Yeah, you were the talking men's room." He says, "My brother and I watched that movie a million times. We used to yell the lines at each other, you know." Hi, mister. Welcome to the men's room. And then, oh, at the end, I think I say, did somebody forget to wash his hands? You know. <laughs> See, they've got to change your IMDb credit on that now. just to, And so it doesn't yeah. say announcer. It just says men's room. Yeah, I would like that. I, well, I thought, should I put that on a resume? <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Ross. It says here you were the... You were you a were men's the, room. <laughs> you were the men's room? Don't you mean you were man in men's room? No, 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 no. I, I, I was the men's room. I'm very versatile. <laughs> <laughs> you can put me in anything. I could be a men's room. Yeah. 
So I'm thinking there's probably not another actor in, 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 in the history of Hollywood who played a men's room. I could be wrong. That, I think that one requires a little more research. But if oh. anybody that's listening that knows someone else that played a men's room, please tweet it to me at 80s Reboot. I'd really be curious. I'll be terribly disappointed if it turns out that someone else did it. But <laughs> I, I, We'll leave that as your claim to fame, sir. Yeah. That's... <laughs> My grand, my grandfather was a men's room. Huh? <laughs> uh, that's something you could definitely brag about. Um, so, I definitely did not want to let you go without asking about Rambo. Was that one fun? Yes. Again, uh, it was a lead uh, role. We had a, a, a wonderful director, a guy named Michael Hack, an, an unfortunate name for a director, but. As he pointed out many times, listen, when they call uh, the Directors Guild and ask for a hack director, guess who gets the job? <laughs> and, Mr. Uh, hack. Yeah, and, but he, he, uh, he let us act. He left us alone, let us, I mean, he, would, he directed, but, you know, if things were going well, he'd, he'd let us, he'd let us uh, work back and forth, and he wouldn't interrupt a whole lot, and uh, yeah, I have fond memories of of that show, and I have I have a, a pretty good story, which doesn't have anything to do with the recording of the show. But while I was recording it, I had some time between engagements, and I was in Hollywood. And in those days, there used to be a, a number of really good bookstores. They're all gone now, but back then they they were in existence. So I was walk I walking from one b- bookstore to the next. And I suddenly realized, oh, there's a, a star ceremony going on across the street. Uh, they had the microphones and the crowd. And uh, I wonder who's getting their star on the Walk of Fame. And uh, it turned out it was Richard Crenna, who played, uh, I think, Colonel Troutman is that it? in Rambo, the movie. And I thought, oh, yes, of course, because the, I think the third Rambo movie was just about to be released, and they usually time these star ceremonies so they can promote a movie. So I thought, well, that's interesting. And then uh, the MC said, oh, wait a minute, I see uh, a big black stretch limo coming down Hollywood Boulevard. There must be a big movie star in there. I wonder who it is. And I thought, oh, I bet Stallone is here. And sure enough, the limo pulls up, the door opens, and out steps Sylvester Stallone and waves to the crowd, and they're all cheering. And it suddenly occurred to me, my God, the movie Rambo is on that side of the street, and the cartoon Rambo is on the other side of the street. (laughs) And just about then, I feel this tug on my sleeve, and I look down, and there's this sad little guy, and he says, got any spare change? (laughs) <laughs> and I'm fishing around in my pocket and I'm thinking this sort of explains the pecking order of show business. <laughs> the on-camera Rambo dressed to the nines arrives in a stretch limousine to the cheers of, <laughs> of the adoring throng. The cartoon Rambo is across the street leaning on a parking meter getting panhandled by, by a bum. You know? <laughs> if, I, uh, if I ever had an ego problem, that, that took care of that. I'll tell yeah. you. Check that one at the door. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a great image. Um, you almost should have waffled your way in there, though. He said, hey, I'm Rambo, too. I'm sure he'd have been thrilled. <laughs> that's great. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody get rid of this clown. <laughs> All right. So I don't want to monopolize your whole night. Um, and you've already been generous with your time. But I want to. Is there anything that you're working on right now that you want to talk about? It's very kind of you to offer. You know, there's a thing that's been happening in the last few years. People are so concerned about having their ideas stolen that anytime you audition for something or work on a project, they make you sign this non-disclosure agreement where if you say anything, uh, they can take your firstborn child and your house. And so I don't I'm afraid to talk about anything anymore because I've, I've signed so many of these things. Uh, uh, you know, I got gotcha. you. I guess we don't want you getting in trouble. um, I appreciate that. So thanks for the opportunity, but I'm, my lips are sealed. Understood. Uh, Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, All right. So uh, online though, you've got your own webpage, right? Is that how people find you? There's a website. Yes. It's cleverly named uh, neilross.com. I paid a consultant a 
fortune to come up with that name. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there you can sort of uh, poke around, listen to my uh, demos, and there's a little bit of video on there, and um, you can sort of keep up to date on what I'm doing and, and that sort of thing. Come one, come all. All right, so do you remember how, uh, the voice for the orc? I think he had a, he was, he was a, you know, very heroic. And I think I put a touch of British on it, if memory serves. Something along these lines. Yeah, sounds very good. Yeah. I think that was him. Yes. All right. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you'd be able to do it for me. That's all. Power Extreme. Oh, that's the other show. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you're crossing the streams. The other thing I wanted to say about Visionaries was it, uh, the, what I loved about that show was it gave me the opportunity to meet the amazing Roscoe Lee Brown, who uh, played um, Merklin. And he was uh, this fascinating uh, man, one of the greatest, possibly the greatest storyteller it was ever my privilege to know. If you got to spend an hour or two in his company, uh, you uh, you would never forget it. And uh, thanks to that show, I got to meet him and, and get to know him a little bit. And, and uh, that was just so delightful. He's he's gone now, unfortunately, but uh, uh, it was it was a, a delight to know him. Yeah, there are so many great names that are on the uh, uh, the roster for mm -hmm. uh, visionaries. Yeah, I'm noticing Jim Cummings, and I'm thinking that may have been the first time that I ever worked with him. I think he was an up-and-comer at that point. It was a much smaller talent pool, and there was a place called The Voice Caster where they cast voices. And, you know, all roads lead to Rome. Sooner or later, you ended up at The Voice Caster, and I started seeing this guy. I, I hadn't seen him before. And I finally asked, "Who who is that?" And they said, "Oh, he's a, he's a new guy. He's really good. He's 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 managing a video store in Orange County, and he comes up here to audition. But he uh, he's not going to be managing a video store much longer. And uh, he wasn't. He didn't. He broke through, and uh, he had a fantastic career. But I think that was the first time I worked with Jim was on Visionaries. Did you ever cross paths with uh, Larry Kenny? I've met him, uh, but uh, no, no. Okay. Yeah, I got a uh, chance to interview him as well, uh, obviously talking about Thundercats at that point. Well, he's another fantastically tal talented guy. I mean, I, sometimes, and I, I'm, it really isn't false modesty, I get into some of these sessions and I think it is just such a privilege to get to be in the same room with some of these people. They are so wonderful, so talented. I'm just, I'm just thrilled to pieces just to get to, to work with them a little bit. Yeah, I guess, yeah. That, I guess that's a great question. Um, you, you've obviously been in the industry for years. Uh, what would you say would be the biggest difference between the work that you'd done in the '80s versus modern day times? Well, I think it, the the tone of the shows changed. And a lot of the newer shows, not a lot, but some of the newer shows I see, it's almost like cartoons making fun of cartoons. And, and of course, they're, they're making them now for adults, which they didn't do back in the 80s. We were mostly shooting for an audience of, you know, roughly 12 to 15 year olds. And back then, they wanted people who could come up with wild, zany, crazy voices. Now there seems to be an emphasis on no, 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 just just use your regular voice. We don't want any of that cartoon stuff. Well, to me, that cartoon stuff is what made it fun. These are cartoons, are they not? You know, <laughs> if you want, uh, if you want real, shoot it live. You know, get a camera in there and just make a damn television show. Right. But uh, I'm not in charge anymore, so not that I ever was. <laughs> That seems to be the biggest the biggest difference. That and the fact that uh, in the eighties they insisted on the whole cast being there. I mean, if you couldn't be at a particular recording session, oh, oh these actors, you can't depend on them. Her, and that's all changed now. Most of the time, they work people individually, 
and glue it all together. And why that change has happened, I don't know. Maybe because they, they started using so many celebrities and those people aren't available that much. And so they'd have to work around their schedules and maybe they just got used to working people one at a time. I would assume, though, that you'd be able to work off the energy if you were in the same room with somebody, though. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, I, I liken acting to a, a, a tennis volley. You know, if you get two really great tennis players volleying, you don't care who wins the point. It's just magic watching the the shots. But if you get a really good tennis player playing a lousy tennis player, it's not a good match. And, and yeah, you you... you you, you need the other actor to bounce off of. And a lot of times when you work alone, you read your line and then you sit there and read the other person's line and try to imagine how they're going to say it. And then you react to that. And it works, I guess. But boy, it's so much better if I'm doing a scene and I got Jim Cummings or, you know, Peter Cullen or... Or, or the late great Chris Lada to bounce off of it. It just it, it brings things out of you that you didn't even know were there. So I don't like working alone, but yeah, I, I would assume that'd be you. You definitely have a, a a lot better experience being able to you know, like I said, work the room. But mm. at the same time, you said you were a bit of an introvert. Well, that was the interest. That's the interesting part. Uh, after twenty years of radio, I started. The two careers overlapped. I was working voiceovers and radio for about a three-year period. And I I started to go to these uh, cartoon sessions, and I was having a ball. And I realized I'm not as introverted as I was. I've kind of matured. I'm sort of enjoying working with other people. And then I'd have to go back to the radio station and be locked all alone in a little room talking to myself. And it was almost like punishment. And I would find myself running out of the studio and into the hall just to talk to somebody. And I realized I've changed. I'm, I'm not, I'm still kind of introverted, but not as bad as I was. And I, I found that, that working with five or six really uh, talented folks uh, is so much fun. Uh, that it just, it, it made it almost impossible to go back into a radio studio and work alone. And have you, in any of the modern shows or movies that you've worked on, have they given you that opportunity to do that again? Or is it, have you, has everything been just solo now? Most of what I've been doing is, has been solo. Of course, when you do games, that's solo. I think the last time I worked with a cast was uh, on some of the Kung Fu Panda stuff that I did. And that was fun. They had... I think we had pretty much the full cast in for those. But more and more, it seems to be they want to work people individually for whatever reason. And I guess we'd have to ask the uh, bosses in charge why that is. Well, I've learned. Don't ask questions. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Neil, I really appreciate your time tonight. Oh, my pleasure, Dave. Thank you. It was a, a lovely interview. I enjoyed every moment of it. It definitely a lot of fun, and I thank you once again for your service, and then also all the great memories that you gave me through the 80s. I, I appreciate it. Well, my pleasure, and I always say thanks to the, the, the fans, because thanks to you folks, I got to spend my entire adult life doing what I wanted to do, more or less, and that's a, a rare gift, a rare privilege, so I'm very grateful to you folks. Yeah, I think that if you could have a profession that you you're excited to do, then I think you're where you need to be. So I'm uh, I'm glad that you found that. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Yep. All right. So have a good night. All right, my friend. Uh, again, I apologize for last week, and uh, hopefully we made it up to you tonight. Oh, definitely did. And I appreciate all, you know you being generous with your time and even rescheduling. So I, I really appreciate it. All right, man. Have a good one. You too.
We hope you've enjoyed this show. This podcast is part of the 80s Reboot Overdrive channel on Southgate Media Group. You can follow us on Facebook on the 80s Reboot group page. We're also on Twitter and Tumblr at 80s Reboot. We invite you to check out all the wonderful podcasts and blogs available at southgatemediagroup.com. And thank you for reliving the 80s.